Well, hello and welcome to Nightmare Tonight. It's been a while. My name is David Stockdale. In this episode, we'll be going over some of the major points of a book called The Culture of Narcissism by Christopher Lash. The full title is Culture of Narcissism, American Life in an Age of Diminishing Expectations. Uh, Now, this book was initially published all the way back in 1979, but I found that a lot of the insights the author makes in this book were uh, extremely prescient with respect to today's cultural landscape. I should note that Lash has at times been characterized as reactionary by some critics or maybe more charitably speaking, socially conservative. I don't know. I have mixed feelings on the topic, although to be completely fair, this is the only book of his that I've read. At any rate, I find the general thrust of Lash's argument in Culture of Narcissism to be on point. But um, as always, I encourage you to read this book critically and come to your own conclusions. In this app, I really just wanted to review some of the main ideas of the introduction of the book. If anything discussed here has piqued your interest, maybe check the book out and see what you think. All right, let's get going. Lesh uh, starts off by making an observation. Uh, He says that we've grown so accustomed to catastrophe that we've stopped seriously considering ways to proactively avert them, instead opting for individual solutions, mere survival strategies, as he calls them. Through this insight, we can understand the rise of self-improvement, Uh, products, which in his day and age took the form of books and uh, tapes. Self-help is an analogous term. The focus on self-improvement and uh, another thing Lash alludes to, faux spiritualism. Uh, The focus on these things tends to preclude the very possibility of political action as a potential thing one might conceivably do. This is because, again, these paradigms are geared towards individualistic solutions as opposed to collective political organization. Here, Lash critically examines a quote by the director Woody Allen from the film Sleeper. In the film, Allen says, I believe in sex and death, two experiences that come once in a lifetime. All throughout Sleeper, there's a continuous sentiment that political solutions simply don't work. The sort of provincial myopia was common in the 70s, particularly in New York. Here we can observe what would later come to be known as capitalist realism by Mark Fisher. The sort of narrowing of the political imagination later became reified with the fall of the Berlin Wall and uh, the general belief that there is no alternative to the capitalist system, to liberal democracy. The ethos of which uh, culminated in political scientist Francis Fugiyama's end of history thesis. So on this point in particular, I think Lash was exceedingly prescient in his time, uh, noting these general trends that would later become sort of like all-encompassing paradigms or uh, just pervasive things that are generally accepted by society at large. Lash then critiques what he refers to as the consciousness movement, Now, when he says consciousness movement, I take him to mean uh, the proliferation of so-called New Age philosophical books that really took off in the 70s. Lash says the consciousness movement is different from other religious paradigms in that the current movement is not concerned in any way with posterity. 
there's a distinct lack of investment in the very concept of future generations as a basis for the movement. Whereas prior religious movements reacted towards the possibility of the apocalypse with a concerted focus on the past as well as the future, the new narcissism, as Lash calls it, is all about the present moment. An account of the so-called weathermen reveals this deep-seated narcissism. Let me give you some quick context on the weathermen if you're not familiar. Near the end of the 1960s, there's an organization, the largest leftist organization in the United States at the time, called the Students for a Democratic Society. Uh, there were two main factions vying for power within the SDS. Uh, there was the Maoists and the Castroist factions. The Maoists were focused on uniting workers in order to carry out a revolution. Uh, in the footsteps of Mao himself, the Castroist faction was focused on racial justice. You might say to yourself, these two things are, of course, not mutually exclusive. In fact, they kind of go hand in hand, if you ask me. But nonetheless, the Maoists and the Castroist factions really butted heads. That's probably an understatement, actually. The Castroists wanted to emulate the Black Panthers very much. In 1969, the Castroists actually got the leader of the Black Panthers to come up on stage and declare the Maoists to be racist. The Maoists were summarily kicked out of the SDS and the Castroists took power. At this point, the weathermen dissolved the SDS in order to avoid threats to their power. And of course, a series of exoduses followed. They eventually shrank to around 30 people. So this whole story is basically, I mean, it sounds like a parody of what would happen in a leftist movement, but this actually happened. So yeah, sounds a bit heavy handed, but it's what actually happened. The weathermen eventually came to be known as the Weather Underground, and they bombed a bunch of buildings and ended up mostly killing themselves in the process. So, yeah, they're a bunch of idiots. FYI, there's a great book on this called Days of Rage by Brian Burrow. I am uh, basically just paraphrasing his books, so go read Days of Rage. In the context of culture of narcissism, Lash only briefly refers to the weatherman in the context of his critique of Susan Stern's memoir. He says the language used in her memoir, at least when it comes to the weatherman, pertains largely to personal experience and identity construction as opposed to prior notions of organizing unity, such as the idea of giving oneself up to a larger cause. Here Lash quotes Stern. I felt I was part of a vast network of intense, exciting, and brilliant people. But Lash notes, when the leaders she idealized disappointed her, as they always did, she looked for new heroes to take their place, hoping to warm herself in their brilliance and to overcome her feeling of insignificance. In their presence, she occasionally felt strong and solid, her words, only to find herself repelled when disenchantment set in again by the quote-unquote arrogance of those whom she had previously admired by their quote-unquote contempt for everyone around them. There's something of a paradox at the heart of the idea of narcissism. While narcissism is characterized as the aggrandizement of the self, narcissists require an audience to validate their self-esteem. They can't stand alone. They're pathologically incapable of realizing their own individuality. Despite the isolation of the self, which is intensified through the valorization of individual will, the possibility of genuine privacy has diminished. The result is that we have isolation without the benefit of actual privacy. Lash uses a bit of Freudian jargon here and there. Don't let that intimidate you. The only real preparation I would recommend would be to at least somewhat familiarize yourself with the id, ego, and superego, if you're not familiar with those terms. 19th century Americans triumphed over the id, Lash argues, through compulsive industry and sexual repression. Americans justified brutality and romanticized the past with the hopes that future generations would prosper due to their work. But now, Lash says, 
we struggle to feel much of anything besides rage. We're overcome with the increasingly banal aspects of human life. With the delegitimization of authority, we've marginalized what Lash refers to as the ego ideal. And in its stead, we've replaced it for the sheer rage entailed by the pre super superego, which Lash characterizes as the impudent reaction of the child whose parents cannot satisfy their impossible desires. You might be confused about this term, pre super superego. I myself was kind of confused about the difference between the id and the pre super superego. I think the major distinction is the expectation that one's parents should be working to satisfy every child's demand, and by not doing so, they've somehow failed. So the rage is rooted in a sort of proto-moral expectation and subsequent evaluation, which then kind of takes root and forms your personality. Lash says that in this day and age, the paradigm of mental health has thoroughly replaced the notion of salvation. Therapy constitutes an anti-religion, not because it's scientific, but rather due to the fact that it has no conception of the future, nothing beyond the immediate needs of the patient. Lash says bureaucracy transforms collective grievances into personal problems amenable to therapeutic intervention. Again, that sounds eerily prescient based on the writings of Mark Fisher with respect to what he says about therapy and the psychiatric system. Lash then praises the qualities of self-awareness often present within works associated with the modernist traditions. T.S. Eliot is explicitly referenced. He points out that more contemporary writers use self-awareness to destroy confidence in the author. Lash thought that there was a certain pernicious trend in the literature of his time. Namely, he expresses concern that authors have acquired the nasty habit of using irony as a sort of cop-out, a way of not taking any real position on matters of great importance. And by doing so, Lash thinks authors evade the responsibility necessarily entailed by being an author, which places the onus on the writer to say something true. This is highly reminiscent of some of the things I've heard David Foster Wallace say on the use of irony in literature. Like there's that saying, irony is the song of the bird that has grown to love its cage. So this proliferation of irony in literature coincides with an appeal to the general public that their desires be met at all times. Lash says, the modern propaganda of commodities and the good life has sanctioned impulse gratification and made it unnecessary for the id to apologize for its wishes or disguise their grandiose proportions. Despite whatever tone might come across in my apprehension of this book, it's important to point out that Lash doesn't seek to moralize when he talks about this new pervasive self-absorption. Rather, he wants to perform a sort of rigorous unpacking of the clinical implications of this culture of narcissism. This emerging trend of self-absorption should not be attributed to middle-class complacency, but rather desperation. He characterizes it as a symptom of the alienation entailed by downward mobility. Another term for this would be proletarianization. The middle class is shrinking. They're being forced back into the status of something more along the lines of the working poor. So a lot of the trends observed here are a result of the middle class's diminishing expectations, to reference the title of the book. Lash says the trouble with the consciousness movement is not that it addresses trivial or unreal issues, but that it provides self-defeating solutions. He mentions three general mandates. Don't invest in love or friendship, avoid dependence on others, and live for the moment. Of course, these are the very conditions that tend to disrupt one's social life and foster problems in relationships, 
And these things are precisely what create a demand for self-improvement literature in the first place. That's why Lash views the whole paradigm as self-defeating. It's a negative feedback loop. Lash then rips another social critic, Richard Sennett, for ignoring the role class plays in obscuring one's true interests. The ruling class always establishes the prevailing morality of a given society. So call Lash a reactionary if you want, but that's just one of the Marxist premises he operates under in this book. Wrapping up, I would argue that a lot of these trends have clearly accelerated. The most obvious connection here is Donald Trump. One might say Trump is the result of a culture of narcissism that has been allowed to run rampant for generations at this point. But the popularity of pop intellectuals along the lines of Jordan Peterson come to mind as well, specifically with respect to his self-help manifesto, 12 Rules for Life. The imaginative horizons of what's possible have been continually restricted to such an extent that people have become extremely desperate and they perceive the only way out, the only path to some kind of satisfaction in life in the allure of self-help. Other titles such as The Power of Now and The Secret are worth mentioning too. Keep in mind, it is desperation, not complacency, at the root of this phenomenon. And rest assured that both major political parties routinely exploit this desperation. I do want to clarify here that the impulse to improve oneself is not inherently a bad thing. Again, Lash doesn't try to moralize on this point. It's just that the major problems we face today can't be solved through individual solutions. As much as you might hear, for instance, that we all just need to conserve more or recycle, that's not really a helpful approach to the problem of climate change at this point. Major systemic change is required. Same goes for the growing chasm between the rich and everyone else. One problem I think Lash maybe fails to address in this book is the open question of what constitutes a homogenous culture. Uh, While Lash does offer a good descriptive explanation of the conditions that have given rise to this culture of narcissism, I think all too often this term culture is used as a floating signifier like an empty label which operates in the place of a good argument. I might refer you to The Idea of Culture by Terry Eagleton for a better analysis of the term itself. There's certainly a lot more that could be said about this book, but I'm going to have to leave it there. That wraps it up for this special Patreon-exclusive episode of Nightmare Tonight. Again, the book is Culture of Narcissism, by Christopher Lash. Thanks for listening and good night.